By whatever dimension you take, the extent of freedom in this country has been going down. And you today are fundamentally less free than your fathers and grandfathers were. If you look at it in terms of government spending, which is the easiest thing to get a handle on, in 1930, total spending by federal, state, and local governments was less than 15% of the national income. Spending by the federal government alone was about 3 to 4% of the national income. Spending by state and local governments was about over twice as large as spending by federal governments. I may say about half of federal government spending was on the military. About half of state and local spending was on, the, on education, on schooling. I shouldn't say education, schooling. <laughs> By 1950, 20 years later, that percentage had risen from 15% to 25%. By 1985, the last year for which I have the figures, it had risen to 43.8%, 44%. That means that every individual in this room and in this country works from January 1st to sometime in June to pay the expenses of government. That part of his income, that part of his product, is being spent supposedly on his behalf by people who are supposedly his servants. I think neither the people who spend it nor the people on whose behalf it's spent would regard that as an appropriate description. At any rate, that is a situation that from 15 percent governments, the fraction of the people's Resources that have been spent by the government has gone up to 45 percent, 44 percent. And what's worse, has become more centralized. Instead of two-thirds being state and local and one-third federal, it's now two-thirds federal and one-third state and local. So you have had both an expansion and an increase. And with respect to that part of your labor, your work, you are in the same status, of course, as a slave, you are working for someone else, not for yourself. The government imposes restrictions on what we can do in a variety of ways. It doesn't cost very much to, uh, to enforce or to enact, to uh, run the collection of tariffs at our borders. But yet, protective tariffs, duties, and so on are as much of a restriction on our freedom as the taxes, and indeed they are a form of taxes. Everybody, anybody in this country who buys sugar, and most everybody does directly or indirectly, pays five times the world price for sugar. Well, in a very relevant sense, four-fifths of what he pays for sugar is a tax paid to the government, which the government in turn uses to subsidize the people who grow sugar. That could be done explicitly by explicit taxes, and then it would show up in the government budget. That's why it doesn't. So what government spends is a, stray, is a great underestimate of its total restriction on our freedom. Consider over the recent years the new government agencies that have been created that didn't exist 40 or 50 years ago. Department of Energy, Department of Education, the National Foundation of the Arts and Humanities, the EPA, the OSHA, the CPSC, the CFTC, and you add any other four letters and you'll have another one. <laughs> Twenty-five years ago, my wife and I published Capitalism and Freedom, and in that book, we listed 14, quote, activities currently undertaken by the government that cannot validly be justified in terms of the principles of a liberal society. I use in that book, we use in that book the word liberal in its true original sense, not in its current corrupted sense. And we added that this list is far from comprehensive. Of all that list, only one has been terminated. That one was a very important one, and I don't want to underestimate its importance. The one which was terminated was military conscription. Yeah. People would say, well, but you haven't really touched on the real freedoms that matter. 
What really matters aren't the kind of economic freedoms you're talking about. They're freedom of speech, freedom of uh, writing, freedom of uh, publishing and so on, freedom of the press. Well, let's look and see, have those been restricted? Tell me, how many professors at medical schools have you seen giving speeches against government involvement in medicine? <laughs> Do you suppose it's because they all believe it's a good thing to have the government paying half the total cost of the medical? I don't mean the government doesn't pay. Government doesn't pay anything. It's only taxpayers who pay. The government has no money. The only power it has is to take from some and give to others. Well, do you think it's a good thing? Do you think that every uh, uh, person in a medical school believes it's a good thing to have half the costs of all medical care being paid for by the taxpayer? I doubt it. But tell me, how popular do you think one of those people would be if he got up and started talking about the desirability of getting rid of, of Medicare and Medicaid and socialized medicine? The businessmen are an even clearer case. A hundred years ago, you would have businessmen who wouldn't hesitate to get up and say some outrageous things, who would talk freely. You had tycoons like Andrew Carnegie and uh, Morgan and others who were perfectly willing to say outrageous things. Today, no businessman will say anything outrageous. Businessmen get up spe give us speeches, but mostly they're about how their, their industry needs special support from the government about how the automobile industry is on verge of extinction unless the government comes along and helps them. Or again, my favorite example has always been the uh, uh, savings bond campaign. Not now, but 15 or 20 years ago when it was a bucket shop operation. Here, the government was trying to persuade people to buy bonds paying 4 or 5 percent interest when inflation was 6, 7, or 8 percent so that uh, they were essentially uh, being sold a bill of goods that was going to depreciate in value, that would be worth less 25 years from then than it was when they paid for it. And yet, every single, almost every single bank in the United States would monthly send out in its statement a little slip of paper saying, uh, we urge you to buy U.S. government savings bonds for your own benefit. <laughs> Heads of major corporations would join, still do, join a national committee with a full-page advertisement in the newspaper every year urging people to buy savings bonds. I've asked them, many of them, would you, do you do that, do you buy them yourself? Oh, no. <laughs> would you recommend to a friend of yours that that's a good investment? Oh, no. Why do you let your name be used this way? Oh, the Treasury and the Federal Reserve wouldn't like it if I didn't. Do they have free speech? And you go down the line. Let me emphasize, there's no free lunch and there's no free, free speech. There's nothing wrong with free speech bearing a cost. You ought at least to have to pay for the hall. <laughs> but it is a serious restriction on free speech if the cost of speaking freely becomes excessively high. I think the cost of speaking freely is excessively high in the country today and has become so for a very large group of people, indeed. I have often said about the only people in this country who re enjoy real freedom of speech are tenured professors on the verge of retirement. <laughs> I used to say that when I was in that state. Now I'm even freer because I am retired. What history suggests is that both the climate of ideas and the course of policy move in very long swings with a course of policy lagging long behind the course of ideas. Adam Smith wrote The Wealth of Nations in 1776, and I may say David Hume developed the basic ideas some decades before that. But The Wealth of Nations was the book that made those ideas uh, available and popular. It took 70 years in Britain before you had the repeal of the Corn Laws. As you know, the wealth of nations was primarily a tract against protectionism, against mercantilism, which is just another word for protectionism. Uh, corn was a word used by the English 
by the European to refer to all manners of grain. It didn't mean what we call corn. They referred to that as maize. It meant wheat, rye, anything you can think of was corn. And the corn laws were tariffs against the importation of corn. It was re widely regarded that they were uh, maintained where they were by the greedy, filthy landowners who wanted to maintain the rents on their land. And there was a great popular movement against them. Uh, and Adam Smith, of course, was a great proponent of free trade. But you didn't get free trade in the repeal of corn laws until some 70 years after Adam Smith's book was written. Now, the intellectual climate, the intellectual tide in favor of laissez-faire, a free market, started, which you can date from Adam Smith's Wealth and Nation, lasted about 100 years until about the 1860s or 70s. The change in the world of practice, the movement toward laissez-faire in practice in Britain, also lasted for about little less, probably 75, 80 years, from sometime in the 1820s to the end of the century. At the time of the Queen Victoria's Golden Jubilee, which I think was 1899, maybe 1898, at that time, total government spending in Great Britain was 10% of the national income. That's a good number. I've always believed that the right fraction was about 10%. The church says to tithe. <laughs> Britain had its greatest degree of freedom when government spending was about 10%. The United States had its greatest freedom and, prosper and growth when spending was about 10%. It looks like a good number to an empiricist. <laughs> and especially to a taxpayer. <laughs> At any rate, <clears throat> you have here then the one movement in ideas, the other movement in practice, the one lagging behind the other, both lasting 7,500 years. Beginning in about the 1870s, you had a very drastic change in the tide of opinion. Fabian socialism started to develop. It took over. It started to replace, let's say, fair capitalism as the dominant intellectual idea. And it lasted for about 100 years, until about the little less, maybe, until about the 1850s, 1950s, 60s. But what about practice? It wasn't until, oh, in the decade before World War I, about 1908, that you started to have a movement in Great Britain away from free trade, and away from a laissez-faire society and toward the welfare state. That's when they first introduced uh, various, so what we would call social security measures. And then it took off. And the Fabian Socialist Movement in Britain dominated the next uh, 50, 60 years in Britain. In the United States, the intellectual climate of opinion had started to shift a little later, 1880s, 1890s. Edward Bellamy's book, Looking Backward, was published in the 1890s. By 1929, the great bulk of the academic community was socialist in its orientation. But the movement in practice didn't start until, in reaction to the Great Depression, didn't start until the New Deal in 1933. And then it took off. Again, you had this long lag of 20 or 30 years between ideas and practice. By, by today, every single plank, economic plank, in the 1929 socialist platform has been enacted. It's now law. The most influential political party in the 20th century was the Socialist Party. I've often said the constitutional amendment I'd like to see adopted is that government shall make no law <laughs> no, no. No, no. <laughs> I'm not going that far. <laughs> Government shall make no law restricting voluntary agreements among consenting adults. Which do <laughs> that would go most of the way. <laughs>